Hello and welcome back to CIS 126. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. As a reminder, the class is being recorded for playback. As such, you're not required to turn on your webcam and microphone if you don't wish. So week one of part two of the class, or AKA week five of the summer, we have more animation to learn, more animation techniques, no homework this week. Next week, more animation techniques to learn, also sound and that sort of thing. Maybe we'll do some sound today, maybe, but definitely next week. And then all of that is culminating into finally the first big project of the summer, which is our animated film project. I'm still kind of figuring out the details of it. We've seen on a previous semester the work that students have done previously. So I'll show those again. But in general, you saw there that there was these short animations of about 30 seconds or so. We saw that there were there was movement on the screen in various ways, some frame-by-frame -frame animation, some walk cycles, more things to learn like the warp, asset warp plus tweens. We still have to look at tweens and sound and such. So all of, oh, and camera movement. So all of that comes together into a project of an animation. Now, obviously, if you were here from day one, four weeks ago, you're still not going to have the ability to make this huge Pixar style of project yet. Uh, even if we were here Monday through Friday for five hours at a time, it's still a big endeavor to learn animation and do animation in the vision that you have in your mind. So in a very short time of the summer, you do have to think about those deadlines and how much effort and time you can put into your work and also balancing your mental health and the like. You don't wanna stay up until three in the morning, five in the morning, and then come in here at noon, very, very tired because you're working to get that perfect bit of hair flowing right. You could, but again, you've got to balance a lot of things. And when we had our guest speaker, Rich, talk about, you know, I want to work at a company that I like to work at. I don't want to work at a company where it's crunch time all the time, where I'm working with bad people, annoying people, and so forth. The mental health aspect of it, you have to consider that as well. So next week, I will give the, uh, the full assignment of the, the requirements of the first big assignment, the uh, animation project. And within that amount of time, you then have to produce something. So looking at the deadlines and the syllabus and everything, yeah, it's coming along pretty fast the, the, whole, summer, the whole summer. Once again, to look at the syllabus. Um, so we're right here on week five of things, basically. Next week, animation things. And then it's the, the final three weeks are planned. The game things, the coding stuff, the video game stuff. So that will also uh, dovetail well with everything else we've been looking at. Uh, but then the animation project is coming soon on that. I'm planning on the usual deadline of a Sunday, but we can consider this, think about this for next week. Let me pull up a calendar here. Now there's, a, there's the good and the bad about having options. But let's, let's talk about this. So... This is this week here, week five. Next week, we still have more, a little bit more to learn and also time to work and such. I'm planning on the 10th to give out the uh, animation project as the big, you know, midterm sort of thing, whatever. And as usual, our deadline is going to be then on Sunday. That's what we've usually been doing. Just to kind of to lay things out. That's what I'm planning. I could give a little bit more time maybe even a whole complete week and project deadline two, I don't know, possibly. I could give a whole F more week than that. However, I'm still going to move on to, on this starting week 17, game project topics, because eventually the semester ends right there, the eighth, the end, basically, slightly slightly more time than that. Actually, let me double check that before I say something wrong. Uh, yeah, so the 31st is the finals week. The 31st. So uh, technically, the semester ends technically on that Thursday, which is weird. But just to kind of zoom down here, I would, of course, give that Sunday as final deadline. So, so looking at the next several weeks, Next Monday, the animation project will be given. Default date will be on the 16th for the due date. 
But if we vote, and I ask you all and we vote, and people want, okay, actually, can we have one more week? Sure, we can do that. But we're still going to move on to, on the 17th, the, the coding, the game part of things. So there'll be that week of learning about coding, the week after that, learning about coding, and then that 31st would be the game project given out to you. And then the deadline will be that on the 6th. So that's kind of looking on the next five weeks or so, four weeks of the semester. I'm not asking for anything at the moment. Just think about this. Here's how the deadlines are coming up because the summer comes at you faster than you think. So consider that there. At the very least, we have this, this week and the next week on animation stuff and then four weeks on game stuff. And it'll all work out. Again, this, what you're doing has been done by students for the past several years that I've taught this class. I've been involved in this class, teaching a version of it since way back in like 2009 or something. And since then, I've been teaching various versions of it. And it's the same people or the same sort of challenges. The big challenge is the deadline. When we were talking to Rich, who, who we interviewed, and I asked him about deadlines, he concurred about that, that in the real world, yeah, the deadline's your number one enemy. If you've got all of the intelligence, even if you have all the intelligence, all of the capability, all of the tools, the time is what you almost never have. We gotta ship this before the deadline to sell it for Christmas and make money and not get fired. That is an absolute deadline that can't be passed, no matter if you've got 50 people working on a thing. And yourself, you're gonna be one person working on your animation and one person working on your game so the deadlines are, are a very real thing. So keep that in mind. I'll bring it up again on Monday if you want to shift deadlines and so forth. Uh, but then ultimately, there is the final deadline that cannot be shifted. I already, I'm already shifting it. Officially, the semester ends on the 3rd. I'm already giving time until Sunday to have more time to work on it. And the final game project, uh, everything that we've been learning so far will, of course, be added to it, to the knowledge. But then it'll be a focus on coding writing code so that when you press a button, something happens. Right now, this project is going to be passive. It plays automatically for some amount of time. You have music and lip syncing and walk cycles and cool, but the game, of course, is interactive. And yes, within the amount of time, in a very fast amount of time, we can create a cool, fun game. Um, and ultimately, I hope you realize that even if you go through this whole summer, uh, this is also a stepping stone to things. Most people that take the, the sequence of classes in the summer, they then go on to San Diego State, UCSD, the Art Institute, you know, the Kubert School, all of these art-focused colleges or general colleges, UCSD, SDSU. And then there, you then you go to another four years of totally focused on all of this art stuff. So this is just a stepping stone. And um Hopefully, though, either you're taking the class for the knowledge and it's interesting and such, or most of you are taking the class because, yeah, I want to get into this industry in various ways. This is a stepping stone to, to the future. So any general questions in, at home or here about the, the kind of big picture of the next month and stuff? Any questions? So let's... Um, back into animate and I want to introduce this concept of scenes. So we'll start a brand new project here as usual full HD 24 frames. So create a new project on the 1920 HD 24 frames. Save it, save it somewhere and um, give it some name, save it, change your background color. Hopefully that's been helpful to have a different background color as you create your projects. If you've been sticking with white, it's probably working fine, but you do want to change 
that color so you can see the details of your project. Now, here's what's what's coming with the animation. We had an we had an assignment previously about a short story of a hundred words. And in that I had said, okay, you've got a character, you have some sort of plot, beginning, middle, and end, a hundred words. It was a challenge to create a little story in that amount of time. Then you needed to create a storyboard with some quick drawings of that same sort of idea. And most of you, of course, are building upon everything you've been learning so far. You can, of course, change things at any point. That's fine. It can, you can be as creative as you want. But you have a big idea so far of what your animation will be. And so one way to help you do that is in the software, we can create scenes. We can have a timeline full of animation, full of backgrounds, full of sound, full of everything in a scene and then create another scene, and in that scene, other content, and create another scene, and so forth. And what's cool then is you can also then easily rearrange the scenes. Maybe you figured out, oh, I want this plot point to happen before this, but I drew the other part first. If we're only relying on one timeline, one scene, that's a lot harder to edit your animation to flow how you want it. So I'm going to introduce here the concept of scenes. We had a very very vague look at it previously, but now I'll go full featured here. On the top left corner of your project, see it says scene one. We automatically have a scene one. We have a timeline with all of our frames and animation and sound and everything. We've got a scene one. Let's go up to the window menu and we have a panel called scene, which I guess is the shortcut shift F2. I never remember that one, but we have that go up to window menu, select scene, little panel, very simple panel, all your scenes, adding a scene, duplicating a scene, deleting a scene, double clicking to edit its name. Let's call this intro. Click your scene one, call it intro. Intro. Then here on the bottom left, click Add Scene. It gives you Scene 2. Let's call this Action. Scene 3, Ending. One of these scenes is its own independent timeline. It can have one to one million frames. It can have one or 1,000 animations and have sound and everything. It's its own complete timeline. And they play in this order from top to bottom. When you um, have some kind of content, just draw, you know, let's, we're going to delete this, but draw a happy face on the intro. And then on the action scene, draw a not happy face, I guess. And then on the ending, draw some other expression. So you've got some different type of drawing or animation on each scene taking place on one frame. So when I press play down here, plays it, but this play button at the bottom is only gonna play the current timeline. And the current timeline in my case is intro and there's one frame, okay. Well, when I play it for real, when I do the test movie, when I say play my whole project, control enter or click the button, then it's going to do a little epileptic warning sort of thing here. Turn that off. Then that played your first scene, frame one. When that timeline ends, it then automatically goes to frame two or scene two, and it plays all its frames. When that reaches the final frame, it gets to the third scene when it plays all its frames it loops back to the intro let's do this on all of these intros make all of these make all of these scenes last two seconds all right so at the bottom timeline i see one second i see two second i want right click on two seconds uh insert frame f5 
I want that first scene to, to last two, two seconds. The action scene also two seconds. You can press F5 on the keyboard. You can use the shortcut right here, insert frame. And then the third scene, same thing. These have a little bit more time that they last, that they exist. And now when I test movie, right, two seconds, two seconds, two seconds, loops back to first scene. Doing something very simple, but very powerful that you have all of these scenes, some amount of animation where you can kind of group together, think about grouping together an idea. You can have a million scenes where it's a shot of this and a shot of that and a concept they're in the alley here, but now they're in the house there. You're not limited to these three. And again, the order of these things, ending, uh, actually the ending is a good idea to be shown first. So if I click and drag ending and put it at the top, you see, you see the little marker there. That's going to happen first. So when I test it, that happens first. The sad part, then the happy part, then the scared part. And then it loops that way. So these can be arbitrarily named, of course. Can have as many as you need. Now, all of this is just to uh, practice. We've got a brand new panel to, to consider. Once again, it's up on the window menu, scene. You start off with a brand new scene one that's empty. You can easily add scenes. You can duplicate scenes, try that. On any one of these scenes, you can select it. Click duplicate, and that will copy everything that existed on that scene. Every uh, timeline, uh, every frame, every layer, everything that was visible, every sound. We haven't really covered sound yet, but everything there. And it gives it an uninspired name, which of course I can change. Change it in any way that I want and such. When I test that, you have a brand new scene that has a copy of the previous scene, and it plays. All right, does that make sense? Any questions on scenes as well there? So it's just a way to kind of group concepts together, group shots together, group parts of the action together. Uh, I haven't exactly mentioned it, but everything we've been talking so far up to this point in the class, there will be a version of that as a requirement for the assignment. Uh, so you will have to do scenes in your in your assignment, some amount of drawing, a background. Um, we learned about walk cycles, frame by frame animation. So everything we've been doing so far. There'll be some aspect of that due for the assignment. There's still a little bit more to learn. So for example, here, all of these scenes. Okay, actually, uh, I'm gonna delete. It's gonna confirm, are you sure? There's, you're about to delete everything. Uh, press control, then click delete button to bypass this alert. Uh, okay, you can, because it's such a big deal. If you delete a whole scene that you lost a lot. And if you didn't, if you don't right away undo it, you've lost a lot. So I guess it's really reminding you, it's really saying, uh, are you sure? And every time it's going to ask you, are you sure? But I guess if you know what you're doing, you can control delete it, I guess, and it won't ask you. Be careful about that. And obviously, I can't delete the, the final scene. There has to be a scene. Fine. So delete everything until you're, until you're, um, until you have one scene, and we'll, we'll call this one again, uh, we'll call this one title this time. And on all of these, Whatever I drew here, select all these things, right? All these frames, right click and um, remove frames. The funny thing is that you have to have a scene, one at least. But the funny thing is, you don't have to have a frame one, which makes no sense, of course. 
But anyway, I deleted everything. And of course I need a frame. So F7, a brand new sheet of paper. Title. So let's say I have this idea for this animation project. And oftentimes there's going to be the very first thing, like the name of the project fades into view and lightning happens and cool music and whatever. I have some idea to show very first at the beginning of the animation. Why not have a, a very, very first scene called title or intro or beginning or anything you want to call it as your first thing visible. And let's say I want to have a, uh, a fade in. I want the screen to be black and then it fades into my uh, into the text, the title of my project. So we've got several things to do here. I want to do a fade in and I want their text to appear. First, we'll do the text. So on our layer one here, name rename that to be text. That's fine, text. This will be, again, what you're doing right now, it's just practice. You're not, you're just learning. So what we're learning here, eventually you'll take it and do it to do it to the animation project. So kind of don't assume, yeah, what I'm doing right now, that's what I'll turn in. This is just practice, of course. And in the text box, in the text layer here, um, I want to use the text tool. We'll look at this first. And this is exactly the same as any other software, Illustrator and Photoshop and Word and etc. We have a text tool where we have access to all of these fonts. That exists here. I'm just going to uh, select any font like wide Latin. I don't know what size I want yet, but I don't know. I'll put a hundred maybe. What color do I want of this text? Maybe black, purple, blue, whatever. All of this can be edited at any point. I have static text, dynamic text, input text. Don't worry about that at the moment. The character paragraph for alignments and such. So like any other app, any other Adobe app that lets you work with text, we have all of these attributes so we can edit. And somewhere in the middle of my document, I'll put, I'll click and I'll, I'll type some title, like let's say the amazing adventure. Any font you want, any size you want. And then, um, Type it, select it to kind of move it around somewhere. The text perfectly centered. If I'm doing multiple lines, I want it perfectly aligned center. No problem. We can do that right here under this, the, the object settings. Paragraph. There we go. We've got the center, aligned center. Got it, or right, or justified. It's exactly perfectly in the center of my document. If only there are a way to perfectly align things, and of course there is. In any of this graphic software, there's always a way to be extremely precise. We have a panel to do that. Window, align. Or if we want to place things perfectly on the screen, often like in the center of things, we can look at the coordinates of any object in another panel. The uh, info, yeah, the info panel. In the info panel, we can look at exactly the coordinates of something. There it is, it's showing me coordinates, fine. But window align, is this icon over here for this panel. You can detach any panels. This panel here lets you align things. Left edge, right edge, center. This is in the horizontal. This is in the alignment of the vertical. Distribute, we'll look at all of these in a moment. Align to stage. If I want this exactly perfectly in the center, I want to activate align to stage and then click the center horizontal align. Now it's perfectly in the center, left to right, and then Align vertical, that's perfectly in the center, vertically. Make sure align to stage is on or else it won't know what will where, what am I aligning it to? Make sure you turn on the stage. Now it's perfectly in the center. Exactly at 507.4 and 551.35 in my case.
Now you don't have to do this, but let me show you this. If you have various things, let's say you're trying to, you draw a bunch of buildings and you want them all perfectly lined up at the tops. We have a way to do that too with this panel. Now we have this text that I wrote here and then you can do uh, edit, duplicate, control D. That's a very useful shortcut. You've drawn something, you've drawn one tree. You want 20 of them, draw one tree and then control D and that will duplicate whatever you've got selected multiple times. D. You don't have to do this, but I'm showing you here. Well, what if I wanted to line up both of these? What if I need to line up both of these objects exactly on the left or the right or something? I could try to eyeball it and maybe the Maybe the guides will lock me into place. Okay, that's helping me. Sure, but let's say it's a little harder than that. You can use this alignment panel by selecting multiple objects, turning off align to stage. Now we're going to align them to each other, align them all to the left edge. Perfect. Let's, let me do it this way. Let's say this one is larger. Let's say this one's larger. This one object is larger than the other. So by selecting them both and then selecting a line, there they go aligning perfectly there or on the right side, right? Or let's say I need to align them vertically against each other. Both selected and then I can align them to the tops, bottoms, centers. Alignment panel, very, very useful. You've got multiple things. You want them to be perfectly aligned. Lastly, on distribute, the, if you look at the icon, it's supposed to show you that it will put an equal amount of space between everything. You've got you know, seven trees and you want them all perfectly aligned, all perfectly distributed together, which is a little mechanical, but sure, if you want to make, let's say boxes, if you want all of these boxes perfectly spaced between each other instead of you moving it pixel by pixel you select all seven of your boxes and you select to distribute them and animate will calculate it down to the fraction of a pixel to put them all perfectly all distributed out so let's see here i'm going to duplicate this several times i want all of these objects perfectly distributed vertically all lined up horizontally. So it looks messy, but now all of those objects are perfectly distributed, aligned perfectly in a, against each other. Size, what does match size do again? Oh, it takes the, uh, okay, so the icon tells you. So if you got a little item and uh, there's a bigger item and you match the, their widths, the little thing will get stretched out to be the size of the big one? Or does it average them both together? Something like that. So you can play with those. But uh, here's a way to make one thing be exactly the same as another. And spacing. What does spacing do? Space evenly, vertically, and horizontally. What's the difference between distribute? Hmm, there must be some difference. But anyway, play with those if you need to. This is just to show you that this software is complicated, like many software. And not everything is something you need to do all the time or memorize all the time. I've been working with this software literally, probably, probably literally next year, 20 years. I first learned Adobe Animate, yeah, way back in 2004, 20, somewhere around there. And I don't have everything memorized because I don't need to do everything all the time. The things that I need to do often, I memorize that. But yeah, I don't remember what each one of these things does. And the cool thing is try it, press it, see what happens, mistake, okay, undo, easy. Let's say that the name of your movie is that, and you wanna fade in to see it. Now here already you have a decision. Do I want the text to fade in, or do I want everything to be dark, everything black, and then the black fade away? to show the text. Either one of those ways could be a, um, could be a way to um, 
to do your project. And we can try both in a moment. But what I want to do is I want the screen to be dark and then to fade into my words. So make a new layer, lock your text layer, make a new layer, and we'll call this fade. Now, we have to think in the parameters of the software to accomplish what I have in my mind. And the way this will work is we cannot control the stage color to be one color and then fade into another. The stage color must always be the same color in every scene. Every scene cannot have its own stage color. The whole project has a stage color. The way we get around that is by having a layer that is some color and maybe making it the background, the bottom layer, and then we can do whatever we want there. But the stage color is always locked into one color. And what I want to do here is fade from black to the text. So the way we'll do this is with a black square. We can manipulate a black square very easily. Get the rectangle tool. Our fill will be a black. Our stroke will be none. No color. If you don't select this, it might look slightly weird when you do the animation. But you want an inside color and no outside color. So on your stroke, Draw some box that covers the whole stage. Don't worry about trying to get to the bottom left, the top left corner and starting exactly on that pixel right there. I would recommend whenever possible, start a little bit outside of your, the boundaries of your main, of your main um, stage and then make sure that it covers it. That way you don't have any pixels one pixel, you're going to notice one pixel when it's wrong. All right, so I have this big shape, and I want to animate it to fade out. Or we do this type of animation known as a tween animation, classic tween. I need to convert this basic simple shape into an object, a movie clip. I mentioned this briefly when we did the walking. I want to convert this into a um, an object. So you've drawn your box. You can right-click it, convert to symbol, or F8. That's one of these things to memorize. Some name, I'll call this square black. of movie clip registration center. So if this, if this needs to rotate, it'll rotate from the center. Names can be anything you want, but as you get more advanced with all of this, you want these names because all the symbols that we create are stored in the library. The library shows it alphabetically. If you call, if you call these things with various names, it'll be out of order in your library. It may be harder to find. I'm making 20 different squares for different purposes. If I sort of prefix them with square, they'll all be organized square, black, square, yellow, square, big, square, small, square face. They'll all be kind of alphabetized, organized. Okay. Now this object is a movie clip in our library. We have this object. I want to take mm, two seconds. Right now, our movie is going to be black. I want it to take two seconds to fade in to the text. So on frame um, 48, at the two second mark, right click, convert to keyframe or F6. I want to copy my previous keyframe. Wherever there's a keyframe, there's some kind of change, some kind of new drawing, some kind of new thing to work with. And what I want to do 
is go from a uh, completely visible black square to a completely invisible black square. And then in between, we'll see a brand new way to animate. We want to tell animate, now you calculate going from completely visible to going to invisible and in between. Well, first we need to make this invisible. If you select your black square on frame 48, on your properties over here, you're going to see, okay, position, panel, color effect panel, blend panel, um, effects, and so forth. And under color effects, it's not exactly a color, but under color effects, we have alpha. And alpha is the fancy term for opacity or transparency. The alpha, here we can select various levels from zero to 100 of visibility. I want to set my black square to zero. So my black square on frame one is completely alpha. By default, everything is alpha 100. Vault. Everything is alpha 100, fully visible. Then on the second keyframe, frame 24, that same object is now completely invisible, alpha zero. And in between, anywhere in between, right click anywhere between your two keyframes, right click, create classic tween. Get this brand new feedback on the timeline that it tells you animate is going to do the calculations to convert this into this. And what has changed is 100% visible to 0% visible. All of those in between in 24 frames does it for you. Click play. If you click test movie, fade in happening. It's taking two seconds, maybe too slow. Maybe do it in one second. Maybe I need more time. Do it in three seconds, two and a half seconds. We have all of this control. Does that make sense? Any help so far? We have this object at 100 alpha and then zero alpha. So any questions so far? So we fade it in, but our text is gone. What's, what's going on? I thought I had text there that had the name of our amazing movie. We still have the text, but it's existing back on frame one where it's a completely black square. And the text layer only existed on frame one. So obviously it needs to exist all the way until frame 48, F5. I didn't do an F6. I did an F5. Remember F6 copies the previous keyframe so you can change it. F5 just extends the previous keyframe if you're not gonna change it. And now when I test it, happening and the text is there. So did you set your alpha zero? Yes. If you did it'll help right over here, please. So we've got this happening. And this can be done on, on anything in animate. Right now we're doing a black square going into a, an invisible square. What if I have the opposite where I have text that is going to fade in? I'd have to kind of do the same thing where I have this bit of text that I have to convert to a symbol and then have its, this is backwards now, have its alpha to zero and then it ends with alpha 100 and in between I tween it and it'll go from invisible to visible. We'll practice that on the end of our movie here. We're kind of playing with a little intro part, a little action part, a little ending part. So we'll practice that one moment. And there's many ways we can do this, of course. So. Let's say the name of our movie fades in. Perfect. 
context, I want to have a little bit, maybe I want my, um, maybe then now I want to have my, my, my scene, my background, my, my forest scene or whatever. Uh, so I would create a new scene. Let's create a new scene to now have a scene, uh, an environment. I could continue from this point forward, but again, get in the habit of using scenes to kind of have them as a way to focus on something. And then you, you have its own timeline where then you can do all that you need to in that one timeline. So let's make a new scene. I'm going to bring back my scene panel. I closed it to not have so much clutter, but that was back on window scene. I've got my title scene. I want to make a new scene, maybe call it background. Brand new scene. It's brand new scene. I'm going to make a very simple forest, I guess. Don't get too complex at the moment, but I want to create um, a simple little forest scene. I'm not going to fill in any special colors or anything, just a scene. Doesn't have to be a forest, it can be whatever you want. But since my story is called, what did I call it? An amazing adventure. It's going to happen in the in the forest. Notice again here, I drew to the outside of the of the stage. I would recommend you do that, just because then it's easier later on when you do animation or when you do the coloring and so forth. And when we look at the camera and such that we have a place to actually move around within our project. Out of curiosity, if you click test movie, we have that fade happening, we have the name of our movie, and then we have the scene, and of course it disappears right away, which is the nature of things, which is what I've said previously, that everyone's gonna forget this. In our mind, this, forest exists forever until the next thing, but obviously it doesn't. It only exists for one 24th. Also, back on title one, of course, when this fades in, it's going to be there long enough to read it, and then we move on to the rest. Well, no, of course not. We've only got it lasting. When it fully fades in, then it ends at that, and then we go to the next scene. So again, this is a very beginner mistake. We don't add enough time before or after our animations. I want this text to be visible for two seconds. We're on frame 48. We need to go two seconds. We can either do math in our head or just look at the timeline. Two seconds is over here. If you're doing math, 24 frames per second, we need two seconds. 24 times two, that's 48. I'm currently at frame 48. 48 plus 48 is 96. But it shows right there, 96, four frames, four seconds. So my text, I need it to be visible for up to, up to the fourth second. So F5, more time. This fade-in happened. It no longer needs to exist in the timeline, so it can end there. That's fine. After it fades in, then it pauses for a moment. Then it moves on to the next scene. So fade in, pause to read it, then to the next scene. OK, conversely. Actually, I want there to be darkness for a moment. Maybe I'm going to have music playing in the darkness. Then a fade in to my text. Now, this is the opposite. Now, I need time before my frame one. Obviously, there's no negative frame one, negative frame two, negative frame three. But I need time. I need frames before my starting frame one. OK, so what I need to do there is a little bit more complex. This is why the planning the writing, the storyboard all comes into play. Right now we're doing it off the top of our head and we're stumbling here and there. But when you have a plan, when you have a storyboard and an idea, you can do those things without having to backtrack and fix things. 
I need to fix here darkness before the actual faded. Now, I'll show you first, don't do this yet, but I need to select all of these frames over here, them over, let's say one second of darkness. But again, you have to select all of these frames to move them. You can move things on the stage. You can also move things on the timeline, but you're moving two different things. A frame is everything that you see and then clicking on the stage is just the one thing. I need to move all of these frames over. So careful here, because if you click one time and then click to drag to select, whoops, I'm moving the thing. Get in the habit of um, pressing or clicking on, in, on a completely empty different place of the timeline and then click and drag and hold, click and drag and hold to make a selection. Because again, if you click one time, it thinks, okay, you selected that. Now let's move it. Nope. I want to select more than one thing. Click and hold and drag to make a selection of all of this intro animation part stuff. All of those 48 frames are selected across two layers. Now I will click and drag that over and it shows you your starting point. I will say one second. Frame 25, hit one second of nothing. The fade happens. Actually nothing, nothing. We have the background color, black background color. So gray, then black, then fade. That doesn't make sense. So this very first frame, I have my, in my library, that black square that I drew a little while ago, that I'm gonna drop a copy of it on frame one, which is currently empty because you see when we move this all over, we moved it over, there's nothing there. So it creates a blank keyframe. So grab a copy of that square from the timeline, drop it on the stage, align it where it needs to go. Didn't we just learn that alignment panel to align things perfectly on the stage? So you move all your frames over. You start on 25, you have nothing there. So from your library, grab the square, drop it in. You align it exactly in the center. Now we have the darkness for one second before the fade then starts. And this is a thing that again, beginners, unless I point it out to you, you're gonna feel like, why does this not feel right? Why does this not look right? It's kind of a subtle thing. It's about this time, it's about pause, it's about showing nothing for some amount of time, showing something for some amount of time. That's a skill that you pick up in. And it's sometimes it's a feeling too. Does it need to be one second? What about half a second? What about two and a half seconds? I can teach you, anyone can teach you the tools, the software, but teaching how to make something good, that's a little more complex. And that also comes with experience. Sometimes it's a feeling, not a technical thing. This is exactly three pixels. No, it, it feels right when this is, you know, seven frames rather than three frames. Bit of pause at the beginning, then a fade in of two seconds, then the text is visible for two seconds, then we go on to scene two. You see, animation is not just the literal, this creature's moving across the stage. This creature's in the forest. It's also about fading in text. It's also about uh, moving imagery around. It's zooming in on the camera. We'll look at camera, zoom, and so forth in a moment. But here's our scene one. Scene two, background. Let's say for scene two, <clears throat> what I want to do here is, here's another type of animation using camera animation. We've been looking at our scene as if a camera was pointed at it. The camera itself can be moved around. So my idea here is 
this amazing adventure. In my case, uh, I'm thinking about it on the spot. It's a bird that is going to go fly off on an adventure. And so maybe I've got a bird's nest. Go in and draw a bird's nest right here. So what I want when I come into this scene, I want maybe a camera to be focused on this tree over here. Then we kind of zoom back to see the whole scene. Then we zoom in to see the bird next. So this can be animation too, not just literally, literally drawing every frame. The animation can be also the camera. And we have that capability with animate. So think about that. We're going to start someplace in our scene. Then we're going to zoom out. Then we're going to zoom into where our scene actually will kind of take place. So maybe draw something. In my case, I'm going to draw a little bird's nest over here on this tree. Uh, thing here. What's my perfect? Oops. Bird's nest. Bird beak right there. Sure. So there's going to be some focal point somewhere in your scene, whatever you drew. And, um, I don't know how much time we need for all of this to work just yet. So I'm just going to randomly put in here 100 frames. So make this scene visible to 100 frames. Go to frame 100. Just a little bit more than four seconds. Actually, just to round it off, five seconds, 120 frames. Let's go to frame 120. Press F5 there or click the insert frame. This scene, th this object is not going to change for five seconds. What's going to change is the camera, what it's looking at. Lock that layer, call it something if you want to. You should name your layers so that you don't lose track of them. Whatever makes sense to you, mine will be forest. Lock the layer. Remember to lock layers you're not currently working with because you don't want to accidentally edit something that, uh, that you didn't plan. What's going to animate is going to be a camera. You see up on your layers over here, you have all of these icons. There's a little camera icon, the universal square triangle icon thing here. Add camera. Every scene can have its own camera. There can only be one camera at a time. And what this is, is a way to look at your scene. And then via classic tweens, we just saw the classic tweens a moment ago, animate for me a black square fading out. Do, do it for me, tween it, in between for me. Camera can be done the same way where position my camera here, position my camera here, tell animate classic tween it for me and do a nice smooth movement from here to there or a fade out or a, a zoom out. Uh, have it focused on one thing and have it focused on everything. Tell it to tween it, and in between, it will animate the whole movement. If I click on that icon, you get a brand new special layer, a brand new tool on the screen, and also on the left, the um, or on the right, we have the uh, properties where you can mathematically calculate things. You have these sliders and so forth to work with, but if you need exact positioning and so forth, you have X and Y coordinates, we have rotation, we have zoom level, and then these button to reset it to go back to regular. Now, don't do anything yet, but let me show you here. This slider right here, ooh, zooming in, zooming out. If I switch over to this other, eight, cool. Um, reset button takes you back to reset. 
If you click on any of these, you have that, yeah. If you click and drag on the camera, you then have movement of nothing is actually moving like with the move tool. We're moving the camera. It's going to be opposite. It's going to be in, in video games. What's it called? Y flipped. When you push the controller down, you have your character look up. When you push the controller back, you have it look down, unless you change your mappings on your controller. But here on the actual scene, you're, you're kind of pointing, you're moving the camera in different directions, just the camera, not the actual stuff on the screen. Um, and all of that can also be reset back to regular levels. mathematically input exactly. So I want to first be zoomed in on this tree to then zoom out to everything. So on um, frame one of the camera, I'm going to use the zoom. Now, the interesting thing about this, these sliders is that they are relative. If I zoom it like this, I further want to zoom even more, but I'm all the way to the edge. When you let it go, it resets here so that then you can slide it again to zoom in even more. So every increment here is more and more zoom, which in my case is 600%. And I'm going to try it. I don't know. I'm going to put it somewhere over here, three quarters of the way or something. And then move my camera so that that tree is in the center and then zoom in some more amount as well move the camera again get used to it, it's kind of backwards move the camera so that the top of this tree i don't know what you drew but i've zoomed in some amount in my case 290 my x and y coordinates are something but i'm focused on one part of my drawing on frame one the scene two will start zoomed into one part again thinking ahead i need to pause here for a moment so that when someone watches my movie they can absorb what they are seeing, what I'm trying to show them. Me, as I'm working on this, I know what I'm looking at. But when someone else looks at it, they only know what I show them. And this is part of the 12 principles of animation. I believe it's called staging, where you have to create a scene and linger on it enough for the viewer to process it. This is important for me to look at. This is enough for me to orient myself in this world. This is enough for me to look at a character so that when something changes, I get what's going on. So let's say for two seconds, this scene begins and I want to pause uh, on this tree. So frame 48, press F6 there. On the camera layer, the camera can have its own amount of frames where we then have some amount of change and so forth seconds of pausing here when the scene starts. Move a little further. Then I want two seconds now to zoom out to see the whole scene. So frame two to frame four. On frame four, or second four, frame 95, F6. I want the change to happen between frame two and frame sorry, uh, frame 48 and frame 95. Between one and 48, no change, but between 48 and 96, a change. And the change is, okay, now I'm gonna start to zoom it back out. I could just use the numbers over here. Take me back to 100, reset me back to zeros. I did it in the wrong place. Do that on 46. I'm doing it back on the wrong spot. Okay, undo that. Be careful here again. Even someone that has practice, you have to be careful thinking four dimensions. On frame 96, do this. On frame 96, my camera, if you don't see your, your values here, click once to kind of tell it that I want to edit my camera view. Set that back to 100. Set that back to zero, zero. 48 zoomed in, frame 96 zoomed out. Anywhere in between those two keyframes.
a sick queen. Create classic tween. And says, okay, we got you. We'll do it for you. We'll zoom out. If you press play on this timeline, you will only see this timeline. Press test movie. It'll first show you your first scene. Then your new scene. If you don't want, if you've already made seven scenes and you don't want to wait for six scenes to finally see your seventh scene, you have control, test scene, which is control, alt, enter, control, enter, test the whole movie from the beginning, all scenes, control, alt, enter, it only tests the current scene. How's there? Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Are you making your making your camera move properly? Any questions? So we have the little bit of pause. We have a little bit of pause at the. Um, A little bit of pause at the beginning. There's a little staging to be aware of what's going on. Maybe we maybe we hear birds tweeting. Maybe we hear a little. Uh, we have a, a, some pleasant music playing for a couple seconds. Then the camera zooms out. We didn't plan it, but then there's a little bit of pause at the end there. Maybe we pause for some amount there to take in the scene. Then we zoom into where the bird is at. Then we'll take a break in a moment. Um, most beginners would then right away. Okay, now I got to animate. I'm zoomed out. Now animate to zoom in without that pause, without that staging, without that breathing room. So I want one second of pause, then movement to zoom into the bird. And instead of taking two seconds to zoom in, I'm going to zoom in quickly. You get a different vibe. A slow zoom out, very leisurely. It gives you one certain sense, one feeling. A zoom in quickly gives you a different kind of sense, right? So I need to forest, make it visible until frame 145. I want one second of pause from this keyframe to frame 120 is one second. So I need a new keyframe there, F6. So no change here from here to here. Then a zoom in very quick. We'll do it um, very quick. We'll do it only like five, five frames, five twenty-fourths of a second. It's like a quarter of a second, right? So we're going to say from five, from from one twenty-five to twenty-five, a very, very, very quick zoom. So F6 on frame. 125. So no change between 95 and 119. Then a change from 120 to 125. The change is camera. A C on the keyboard that pulls up the camera. Uh, the camera is also hidden somewhere in one of these tools somewhere. But remember the C, the C key is for your camera. Do they have the camera? But anyway, just remember C. C will bring back the camera so that then now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the zoom plus the movement. So I have to remind myself it's backwards and then some amount of zoom so that my little bird is right there. Now, here's a little part of also the artistry of things. Character, my hero. This is fine. But the artistry, what if 
actually the main character is right in the center of the screen. By zooming in that I see the whole tree top and the characters there and not quite centered, well, visually what I'm looking at is very centered, but conceptually it's not centered. The main character is not centered. Here now, the tree is off center. The tree is not the main character. The bird's the main character and it's centered. So my eye is right in the center, unambiguously staging that that's the main character. This character is the main character gonna have an adventure. It's not wrong that I had the whole tree centered, technically, but artistically, maybe that's more correct. So it goes from whole scene is zoomed out to whole scene is very zoomed into the character in between. Right click, very classic tween. Animate will then process for me in a very short time that zoom in. I don't want to start my whole movie over. Control test scene to focus on this scene. I'm zoomed in, pause here, think about it. Zoom out, see the whole scene, very cool. What's that? Now what happened, of course, there, it only existed for one frame. So of course it loops over. This is why you want to test your work because in my mind, yeah, I zoomed in, there's a main character, let's enjoy. Whoops, it starts over. I didn't put enough time, enough frames, right from here. And then it goes back to full zoom out because further frames are missing, F5. Camera zooms in, stays zoomed in for some amount of time. A moment ago, it was one, one twenty-fourth of a second. So that's why it seemed that looked like that weird reset. F5, give it time. Test it again, only this. Um, on the numpad, is that what it's telling me? Control, Alt, Enter on the numpad. Sure. So control, so test scene so that you don't have to do the whole thing over. Pause, zoom out, little pause here. Quick zoom in, there's our main character. Maybe a little bit more time. Then we'll take a break. Whatever feels good to you, put some more time at the very end there so we can linger on our main hero after that amazing reveal. Some amount of frames to both layers, and we'll take a break. It's 120. Take a 10 minute break. Play with this if you want, or take a break. We'll be back. If anyone needs help, call us over. Make sure it's working up to this point. And take a break if you wish. Back at 120.
Right, so let's go on at this point. Um, in my case, what I want to do here after showing the main character for a moment, then I, I want to have a little animation. Um, I'm going to do the very simple frame by frame animation, but focused on um, key poses. We, when we did the last frame by frame animation, we had that Tanuki character that it had those 10 main poses and then it jumped onto the platform, right? I'm gonna keep it very simple here, maybe just three poses uh, where it will maybe like look around a little bit and then fly away, not, nothing too complex. I'm not gonna animate like the wings moving and everything. It's gonna be the key poses in terms of looking and then it's body drawn kind of like swooping away and that's it, nothing too complex. Again, I don't know what you all drew, but something like that, it's gonna be some basic motion. Now, when we left off here on the break, I had said, uh, add a little time at the end of your animation here, because after that final zoom in, it might not be enough time to focus on, there's our character, see how it starts over. So add some amount of time at the end. Uh, I think for me up to the one second. So frame, um, 168 F5 for both. You have to now remember to also extend your camera. It's interesting because the camera is on its own layer and it can be animated and all of that. When you stop showing the camera layer, it resets back to no change, which might be good to know because maybe I need to show a version of my scene without any camera movements. So then just no longer have the camera layer showing. But of course, I want the camera layer showing that I zoomed into this point so that I could do the next part of the animation. So after about one second, after the, after the zoom in, and a little bit of time at the very end there, in my case, 168, now what I want to do is um, set up a little frame-by-frame -frame animation. So F6 on um, frame 168. And maybe we'll just do it in uh, every five frames or so, just to round it off on frame 175. We'll do an F6. And on camera layer F5. We're not going to be changing the camera, but we do need to keep it visible. So keep showing the camera. Wherever there's a keyframe, there could be some sort of change. So we have some amount of time of pause. And then I think from here to here, so that the character's looking in one direction, then I'll have it look in another direction. So I did F6, I copied the previous drawing. I'm gonna lock the camera layer. So that's a special layer, so you can't really lock it, but I'm gonna unlock the forest layer. I need to change my, um, I need to change my character so it looks in the other direction. And there's several ways I can do it. I obviously, I want the rest of the scenery but I just want to kind of flip the character over. Now I'll do it the easy way here, but it's not the best way, but we'll do it the easy way. I drew this particular character right here in one direction. What about if I select it and edit, or actually uh, modify, transform, flip horizontal. Way over there, which I guess is fine. And then I can just put it into place, I guess. So you see what I'm saying is, I'm just going to make it look one direction, look in another direction. Obviously, the full animation would be that you see the you see the beak moving and it it smears into view and all of that. There's so much that you could do here, but all I'm really trying to do is just flip it over. Uh, in my original drawing, it's faced on one direction, and I flipped it over with modify, transform, flip horizontal. You you can also use the um, free transform tool. And what you could do is you can grab an edge of it. And if you pull it to the right, it also kind of does a flip over. Now, is it too much wider than my original? Is it too much thinner than my original? Yes, probably that's when I keep track of the exact width and height of my original size. I'm not gonna worry about it too much, but I'm trying to get it. It's looking in one direction. And now it's looking in the other direction on its own keyframe. Yes, that also moves the little branch there and 
like that, but I'm saying again, uh, this is, can be very complex if you want to get complex. For the moment, it's my first like version one of my animation, which then I can refine. But on keyframe 168 versus keyframe 175, it's just flipped over. Then gonna flip back and then start to fly away. So just to keep it easy on frame uh, 180, here I can F6 uh, to copy it over, then flip it over. Or, well, my previous 168 is already the right direction. So what if I take that previous keyframe, right click, copy that previous frame, go to 180, right click, paste, and overwrite. And then, of course, extend my camera to the left looking to the right, looking back, and then it's gonna start to fly away. At the speed that we're having, maybe, you know, the look back and forth might be too slow, too fast, whatever. If I want things to be slower, I add more time in between a keyframe. If I want things to be faster, I have less time between a keyframe. So just to show you here, if I added more time, F5, see that? Looking there, looking there, pause, look back, adding more time. Conversely, if I remove frames, that's a shift F5. This time. Ding. And then a, a quick look back and forth. Less frames in between keyframes, faster animation, more time between keyframes, slower animation. We're running at a constant 24 FPS that it cannot be changed. On the fly, it's always 24 frames per second. But now based on your keyframes, how much time in between them, that's what governs speed. So I'm gonna take it all back. You can decide what you like. I'm gonna keep it all simple. Five frames to look back and forth. Frame 185, F6. Camera. Actually, we know we're going to have a few frames, so maybe I'm going to extend my camera. I know I'm going to get there eventually, probably. F frame 200, just extend your camera all the way to 200. You know you're going to see, use the, see that position of the camera for all the way to 200. Might as well extend it there. And we're just kind of doing these key poses at every five frames. So is looking normally left, then looking right, then coming back to the left. Now on frame 185, I'm gonna bring the wings up. I'm gonna to start to have the action of, it's gonna to start to fly away. So maybe wings up. And so I need to draw some wings here, I guess. Um, I guess the way we can do this also is with, um, the, we can do the pin mesh, but let's not mix too many things just yet. The asset warp, we're gonna do it frame by frame. So, um, Let's see, keep it easy. So wings. Got some wings over here that are coming out. Obviously way easier on the tablet. So obviously between this keyframe and suddenly this keyframe, the wings are up, obviously, if I want the finished animation in between, I'm gonna draw the parts in between. Don't worry about that just yet. You want your key poses first, the, the, the big poses that are the most obvious, and then you go back and add the in-between frames. All right, so frame 190, F6, and from here, it's gonna jump over to wings down and already a little bit out of the um, nest. So here, you'll need to be a little creative. The way I'm gonna do this is frame 190. I'm gonna draw over here.
bird. I have to remove the bird that exists there. The trick you can do here is the way I drew it, I can do this trick where uh, I can overlap that, overlap this. Now, all of that is a separate shape because I want to keep the nest. And so I drew a really bad bird over there, but now it's, it's got the wings back. It's got the stretched out flying motion. Obviously, this original bird shouldn't be there anymore, but its little nest should. So yeah, I can use the eraser tool. Okay, erase it, but you saw that's a little complex. So the trick here, remember, wherever there's any line you can push and pull, right? And if you get to often a corner, you can grab the corner. And if you overlap a corner, it detaches it in a sense. Same thing over here. This corner stretching it over here, overlapping on itself, it detached it. Now that's a whole separate brush stroke. Delete. Going from here to here, yes, it is a big leap from here to here. And I would go back and draw the in-between flaps and the like. But right now it's about the key poses. Frame 196. Now here also, if you think about it, I should have from the beginning made a layer like only the forest. I made a I'm drawing the bird on top of the forest, so all of these lines are the beginning I could still do it moving I could still do it better moving forward but this is the part about that whole planning of things I'm going to keep going right here kind of in the wrong way I should put all of these things on their own layer but I'm going to keep going in the wrong way just to kind of show you how you could deal with it that way frame 196 f6 now I need the bird a little bit further off and this time the wings are going to be in the other way so right they go up down up down so maybe in this pose now, the wings will be upwards and maybe off a little bit over here somewhere. I know that on that frame, F6, sorry, 196, it won't, it won't even really be visible. Just a bit, little bit of tail of it, depending how you drew it. And we have this drawing because it's not in its own layer. I need to get rid of it. You can do the same thing that I showed a moment ago where you overlap these lines. That's a separate thing to delete. Overlap these lines. line that's a separate thing delete extend this to frame 200 frame 200 f6 since it's going to be out of the frame, I can keep it simple with, I don't even have to redraw it, but I do need to move it that it's out of the frame completely. Let's move it out there so it's not in the scene. Extend that to frame 215 or so, F5 on all of that. Back and forth a bit. Then it starts to bring its wings up. This is the anticipation part of the 12 principles. We've got the movement. It's got a little bit of the squash and stretch principle. The body's a little elongated. Other moves out, just another key pose where the wings were that way. Now they're kind of upwards a little bit. Again, you're not even gonna see these, but um,
can make some changes. And then out of the scene, I didn't even change it. It's out of the scene and then pause so that we can see it. That staging um, where you see, where you hold there for a moment. The main thing that I can say definitely is add time before and after your animation because um, when someone else plays your movie and it zooms by, that's not great. We are seeing it over and over and over ourselves. We know how it goes. But when someone sees it brand new, if you don't add that time, it'll feel weird. More time. I can't really say how much time, but definitely think in terms of seconds, 24 frames per second. If you add anything less than 24 frames, it's still going to be way too short. I added 13 frames. Why does it still feel weird? Why is it still too too quick. Well, it was uh, that was half a second. Think of 24 frames per second. If you need this to, to, to pause for five seconds, five, for, for four seconds, five times, I mean, four times 24 is something rounded up 100. I need 100 more frames. You're going to get into hundreds of frames on these projects. It happens. Don't think in fractions of a frame. You think in whole seconds, and a second is 24. So if I want a four second pause before going to the next, I need a hundred frames at least, 24 times four. So, but I'll say it'll go, it'll pause for two seconds. So from nine seconds, 10, 11, so 165, just to round it up. I want all of this visible for another two more seconds, F5 on all of that. Test this scene. And when we get to that, there's music playing and a bunch of stuff. And then we got the pause and fade out and fly out, pause for a moment. Then the scene will change to something else. All right. So then. Um, on our title here, I mean, on our scenes here, the scene, in the beginning of the movie, we had the, uh, we had darkness fade away to show text. Now maybe we want that, we want the opposite. We want text to fade in. I want a dark background, white text to zoom in, kind of the opposite on the first scene. And so building up our scene here, layer one, we'll call this background, have the black square in the library, put that onto your scene, align it up. You layer text. And I know with my planning, time before, time after some animation, therefore, um, I want to pause for a moment, one second or so in the darkness, then the text fade in. So one second on the dark background, F5, no change. Text layer. Frame uh, 24, F7. I don't want any text visible. Starting on one second, then text will become visible. Further setting it up, the background, uh, extend that F5 all the way to three seconds. My text to fade in. Okay, you have to think a little bit here. We were able to make the, the square fade out or fade in by setting its by setting its color effect of alpha. Color effect of alpha is working because the black square is 
a movie clip. Text that I wrote back on scene one Just a uh, text object. It's text. So nothing to change on the first scene, but on the third scene, the end scene, the text that I wrote, or any text that I will write, I'm going to write to be continued. I want there to be continued at the very end. So uh, that's going to fade in. But in order for any of these fades to work, any of these tweens to automatically fade in and out for you. What you're trying to fade in and out should be a um, movie clip. So setting ourselves up here on frame 24, get your text tool. I have a black background. My text is on the top of the black background. So I probably want white text or any other text that will be visible on the black. And then I will type to be continued. Find that perfectly on screen if I want. A layer for the dark background, a layer for the text. So again, think everything that is gonna be animated, everything is gonna change, probably you want it on its own layer. When I did that bird, I should have put it on its own layer, but now we know. So this text on its own layer. I want to tween it in eventually, the classic tween, I want to tween that to fade in. Before that happens, I need to convert that text from a uh, regular bit of text into a symbol so that then I get access to the options over here. I don't see that alpha here. Well, we have it in a different way, but um, I, need to be, I need to have that as a symbol. So that text that you wrote there, right click F8, convert to symbol. That text underscore to be continued. Maybe I have different bits of text. So I have the prefix text underscore text for welcome. When we do the game, text for welcome, text for HP, text for NPC uh, speech. So having the prefix of text at the beginning organizes everything in the library. Registration point, movie clip, OK. This now shows that it's a uh, it's an object as a movie clip. This unlocks the color effect, the alpha. This time the alpha, it's going to start at zero and go to 100, whereas at the beginning we had start at 100, go to zero. For the last thing that you did, so OK, start at zero. I want to take one second for the text to fade in. So F6, copy the previous keyframe. Just copy it exactly as is. Zero visibility. Set that, of course, to 100. So first keyframe, invisible. Second keyframe, visible. Again, this, again, this uh, alpha only is working because my text has become a symbol. And you unlock these extra capabilities. And then in between, we tell it right-click, classic tween. Test your scene. You can test your whole movie when you are further along. But I'm focused on this brand new animation, so I'm going to test this scene. All right, I got a little darkness for a moment, then if it, and then it loops over. Once again, main thing, you're going to forget to add time before or after the nation. So more time. More frames. Now I want to see my whole project.
I think I need more time at the end. The to be continued doesn't last enough now that I see it in its totality. Again, as you're working on your own project, you have this false sense of a few things, specifically time-wise. It does then look correct or you get it to feel correct once you actually play it completely. And I would recommend as you work, eventually when you do the main project, have other people look at this, friends, family, et cetera, have someone look at it and then give, ask for some feedback. Like, does this look like, does this show up enough? Can you read this properly? You're all going to make mistakes over and over. Every beginner does it. Whenever you have text, you never put enough time there because in your mind, you wrote it. You know what it says. You read it at the speed of light. But when someone sees it for the very first time, they have to read it in their mind. Okay, to be continued. Cool. Then when it, then when it's a lot more text, the amazing adventure, it might be not enough time that that is visible. One trick to know how long something, how long text is lasting properly is to read it out loud. Don't just read it in your mind where you can read at the speed of light. You want to read it out loud. The amazing adventure. And if you can read it at a reasonable pace, don't read it quickly because you know it's about to end. If you can read it at a reasonable pace, at least two times out loud, it probably is long enough visible there. So let's see here. The amazing adventure, the amazing adventure. Maybe slightly more time, maybe. Because uh, people are going to start to see it as soon as it fades in, but they might not start to read it until it's all the way faded in. So do I count that time or not? Better safe than sorry. Better add a little bit more time than not enough time. That's the one thing that I see beginners mistake over and over and over with text. You don't put enough time to read it. Add in 50 frames, it'll be okay. That's two seconds of readability. And when there's something to read, you, you most likely want people to read it, add time. And the other second most popular mistake is again with time, you don't add enough to pause before or after some action because you're seeing your animation in your mind, it's perfect. But when you actually play it, whoops, it needs more time. It needs 25 more frames, it needs 50 more frames. Don't hesitate to do that. And if you still think it's perfect, have someone else look at it. And then when they say, oh, what's, a, what's this? Then you'll see again you, your blind spots. You're working on it nonstop until three in the morning, chugging all that Red Bull to get it perfect before the deadline. But when someone else sees it brand new, they don't have that baggage of it. Much of a pause there now at the end. Or maybe I have music that is playing there. Maybe the music was triumphant and then maybe the music was very peaceful. And then when, when, when she flew away, then cinematic music, like adventures coming. And that same sound plays until the end. All right, one more thing here. Speaking of triumphant music, let's talk a little bit about adding sound to the project. I want background sound. I want music to happen in my project. We can do this a few different ways. We can have one soundtrack play to the whole project, if that's what you want. You can have different soundtracks play on different scenes if that's what you want, and a couple of other ways. We'll start easy first by having one soundtrack play through the whole thing. Then I'll show you, okay, different sounds for different sound for different scenes. Regarding music, yeah, the best way to do this and for the class and real life, don't steal music. Don't use music of a of that already exists off of Pandora, Spotify, a CD, whatever. Don't take anyone else's music for your project here. That is stealing. That sounds harsh, but it is. It's copyrighted material. It's intellectual property. Someone created that. And even if you pay for your subscription of Spotify or if you have the physical CD, you didn't pay to use it for other purposes besides listening to it. So, but I have that amazing 
own song that will fit perfectly with my project here. Great. You don't have a license to play that Ramones song on your music, on your project, even though you paid for the CD or the vinyl. So for the class, you want to go over to this website, freemusicarchive.org. De Niro? He's died? Oh, no, that's his. Never mind. Distracted. Uh, um, free Music Archive. Uh, just whatever here. I'll allow. Sure. The Free Music Archive. So this um, website is full of copyright free music. This is full of music that is not the big famous music of the big famous artists. But you're going to see music here that has cinematic style, fun style, rock style, hip hop style, classical music style. It's not famous music, but it's safe music for you to use without paying a royalty, without paying a license. You can use the famous music of famous artists, but legally you have to pay for it. And it's thousands of dollars, not the cost of a streaming, you know, $9 a month. That is a whole big other topic. It's intellectual property and such. For this class, do not use any famous music because you are stealing it. You want to get it from here or other such related sites. Maybe assistance, you can find a couple of other copyright free music sound libraries, put them in the chat to, to build up a few copies of a few references uh, for free music online, for royalty free music online. Um, so here you can go to the free archive over here. Joy FMA. Genres, keywords. Go up to discover. Go to genres directly there. I'm going to try it that way. I'm going to go up to the genres. top and what might be cool for my project uh, I rock for the moment or electronic I'll try that under electronic music so then I go okay dubstep glitch house IDM vaporwave yeah some vaporwave might be cool on this the funny thing of course is music is a very important aspect of animation. Obviously it's not visual, but music gives a feeling. And so if I have sad music playing in my project, the whole project is a sad story. If I have happy music playing in my project, it's a happy animation. And I can of course vary it per scene as I'll show you. But for the moment, I will say one soundtrack is playing Play this for a moment. This is the headphone part of it thing. You won't be able to hear it, I guess, at the moment without headphones, but you can randomly pick one. And then later when I give you headphones, you can pick the right one. But just to kind of pick something, let's see what this is. Sketchy cruise ship. All right, perfect. That'll work on my project. Again, I'm not trying too hard at the moment. I'm just showing you this is a website with music that is approved to use. So let's say here, just so that we're all looking at, we're all working with the same thing, sketchy cruise ship, find it somehow or pick anything you want. And then there's a button on the side here, download. Guess you have to log in first. Uh, okay. Um, used to be just a simple download, but I guess now you've got a whole login thing. I guess having free music online doesn't pay the bills. Okay, so um, another place where you can get the uh, music is on YouTube, but it's not exactly how you think. So let's see if I can do this easily. I thought I'd just be able to, I didn't check it beforehand. I thought I could download it easily. But here's another way. Uh, if you go to studio.youtube.com,
if you've logged if you've logged into Canvas, you're logging in with your school account, which is tied to a Google account. If you go if you go to studio.youtube.com, you may see right away a screen like mine, or maybe a create account or something. Again, this is going to be a little bit of an extra step, but I'll cover it again on the next lecture. But if it goes directly to studio here, I'm going to download a sound and give it all to you just so that there's less to do here. But under studio, they have a, a section here of audio library. So this is different than just finding a song off of YouTube, like a Beatles song and using it on my account. Again, that's not right. You don't have the license. You didn't pay the thousands of dollars to download that famous song to using your project. But YouTube in their studio feature uh, does give you access to thousands of songs that are completely free to use on your projects. It's a little bit of a setup. I wasn't expecting to do that right now. I just want to give you a sound. I'm going to go over to the audio library here. I have uh, a bunch of music. Doesn't quite matter which one it is, but I'll just probably pick the first one. That's fine. So here it has a download. So I'm going to download this song. I'm going to give it all, give, give this to all of you just so that we have something to do here, just to show you how it works. And then later on, we'll take the time to actually get music. So in the data files, web design, CIS 125, I'm going to drop this file in here. I do track tribe.mp3, copy that. Right-click copy and then paste it into your project folder. Then I'll show you how to get it into Animate in a moment. But everyone should do this first. On the desktop, the data files, the web design folder, our class folder. Yeah, it's still 125, but you know what I mean. Copy that high noon file into today's project folder. In Animate, we have previously we had a tracing image that to draw on top of where we did import to stage, a visual thing. We're going to do something similar, but this time import to library. The music is not visual, so it goes into the library. Then we can add it to our project. You get a copy of that in your project folder. Then in animate, let's go back to scene one. File menu, import to library. Find your file that I just gave you. Import it and then in the library panel, have the text object, the black square object, and the sound object. There's a little play icon on the top there. Again, you don't have volume at the moment. Don't turn the volume up because you don't have headphones. But here you can also play it from the library. Have as many sound files as you want in the library. And every separate graphic or every separate MP3 file now has been integrated into this animate FLA file. Therefore, it's also making your FLA file larger. Be aware of that. But my FLA here has uh, all of the pieces that I'm putting together. Scene one, I have these layers. I'm going to lock all my layers. Create a new layer, call it soundtrack. And you're not going to see the sound on the stage, but you're going to see it on the timeline. It should be on its own layer. It's recommended that it's on its own layer. 
and it's recommended that your soundtracks, your music, are, are the very bottom most layer. No big reason except for organization. When you've got 50 layers, and you want to find where's my music. If you always put it at the bottom, you'll always find it easy, easily. So it doesn't matter where it's at. You can put it at the very top if you want. But for organization, and again, I've taught this class for years, it is recommended that you put it at the bottom. Then when you click on frame one, soundtrack layer, and you go to your properties, a sub panel, sound, there's no music on that layer, or the music that you added to your library, all 10 tracks or whatever. A couple of other options here, I'll get to that in a moment. But we either have no sound playing on a layer. It, it's not the special case that because the layer is called soundtrack, this will work. No, this can be done on your text layer if you want. I don't recommend that you add sounds to any layer that is not a dedicated sound layer. You could, but I don't recommend that. Put sounds on their own layer. Sound layer, name of my sound is that. Test it. So I've started to add music and I didn't even think too hard on the sound, but that's kind of cool in this project. And notice in the soundtrack layer, I, I see the wave form. I see visually the beats and such of the music. And did you notice that it played the music on scene one? And then when I went to scene two, it kept playing it. And then on scene three, it kept playing it. So that's cool. That's one way to do this. That's the easy way about one song playing on everything. I made a layer, selected its various properties over here. Now, the problem, watch this. If I play it, let me just turn it down a bit. Problem is, we get to the end. It's looping over from the beginning, but the soundtrack is still playing. The soundtrack is still playing from the um, very first scene. This is where it comes into play. We've got these various other syncs or synchronizations. Event start stop stream. Fault is event. If I change it to start, play it. Uh, I forgot to say here. So um, on the start, if there was any other layer of sound with its own music, um, one sound wouldn't conflict with the other. So this is a little anticlimactic. What I should have shown was if I make another sound layer, my background in my main action scene, if I make a new sound layer here, and put its own music there because I want that cool music at the beginning, but a different music here. By having it on um, the default of uh, that default sync, uh, those songs would have overlapped. By putting it on start, one sound won't start until the other one completes. They won't overlap. Um, 
So because we don't have any other music, it doesn't look different, but it, it'll be different when we add different sounds. So start and stop. Um, that other sounds don't conflict with each other. We have start and stop event is they will conflict with each other. If you've got different sounds on different scenes, one will play on its own and then the other one will play on top of it and that'll be weird. We have the third option, stream. This one will be different if I play this one. What stream is doing is it will play the music only as long as it exists on a timeline. Because my main, call it main, on my main action, uh, there's no music here. There's no music on the project. And because there's no music layer on the end scene, there's no music. So stream might be an option that I want to only play that music as long as it is on a particular scene. On start or event, we start the one soundtrack will play throughout the whole project. So I have more to talk about with music and sound and such on the next lecture. But for the moment, I want to show that you can easily import to your library any sound that is copyright free, that is from the approved sites. Have it in your library there and then make a layer to attach the sound. And then how do I want the sound attached? Usually either as start or as stream something to play with over the weekend till we come back next time. There's also other types of sounds to add, maybe like a sound effect. I want the soundtrack to be playing and I also want birds to be tweeting and car sounds and so forth. Again, we'll have more time for sound and such. I just wanna introduce there this concept that adding the polish, adding the sound to this project that we started two hours ago, we're having this kind of cool version 0 0.9 of a project where we've got scenes, we've got the animation in tweens, we've got a camera, some key pose frame by frame animation, looking at symbols that have alpha, having music in the background, getting all of these pieces about um, a, a full movie. Now, a little math here on my scene one. This lasts four seconds, right? Gets to the fourth second. Scene two, this one got up to 11 seconds. Scene three got to three seconds. So that's seconds in total of my animation. I don't have like a timer anywhere here in Animate that can easily tell me that until another step later. But so far, my whole project is taking 18 seconds. Eventually, when we do this, uh, this, this first main project, you will have to do a minimal 18, uh, sorry, a minimal 30 second animation. So far, what we've done so far, that's already 18 seconds. I just need 10 more seconds to get to the minimum. So with these pauses and fade ins and fades out, you can do that when people, when I tell them, if you don't think about it, and when I tell you, you're gonna to need to make at least 30 second animation, 30 second frame by frame animation, I'm gonna need, you know, six months for that. Oh, we're already at 18 seconds with just the, even the basics of things. And then as you further add the rest of your animation, you'll definitely get there. I'll show again examples of previous semesters where a couple of people went all the way up to like two minutes because they didn't sleep that whole week and others that were barely there at 31 seconds. Great, you got a good grade. And those that went there at 25 seconds, great, you didn't get a good grade. Because I'm asking again for, I'm not grading on artistry, that's way too hard to grade, I'm grading on technical aspect. And spoiler alert, all that we're learning so far probably will be in the assignment. Can you do background, simple background? Can you create some scenes? Can you play with some of these classic tweens? Can you do a little bit of frame by frame animation? Oh, I shouldn't say it now, but probably the walk cycle will be extra credit. The walk cycle is very hard to do. 
you do have the tracing um, graphics. I'll probably make the walk cycle extra credit because that's the one that really breaks people in the short amount of time that we have, unless you practice it a lot. But you have plenty of other things to work with and animate and still more to learn. We have one more week still. But we're going to kind of wrap up the lecture at this point. We're going to segue into some lab time. If you want to stay for lab and practice any of these things, if you want to ask for help and such, if you want to wrap up and start your weekend, sure. No homework this particular week, but practice time. So we're on week one of CIS 126, a.k.e. week five of the summer.